Money has become such an everyday part of our life that we seldom stop to think of what it really is. In appearance, it is either printed pieces of paper or metal discs. Why, for instance, should 500 pieces of paper buy such a complicated thing as a motor car? Why should a metal disc buy a much larger piece of metal, such as a tin pail? To explain this, we must go back to the days of primitive man. The earliest groups of people wandered about the earth, living on the cattle that they drove from one pasture to another. Later on, they settled down and gradually learned how to grow and make things and formed small communities. As these communities developed, their needs began to grow and so they traded certain goods for articles that other communities possessed. For example, a man who was a hunter might want to exchange the skin of his captured animals for arrowheads made by a craftsman. This was in its most primitive form, barter. As time went on, communications between the different groups developed, but the transportation of bulk commodities, such as grain, cattle, etc., on an ever-increasing scale, became more difficult to handle on the basis of barter. For purposes of exchange, it became necessary to find an article that was portable and was also indestructible, so that it could be easily handled and used again. For a time, ornaments were commonly used, simply because they were greatly prized and provided the most obvious means of meeting the Instances surviving today are the cowrie shell necklaces, still used for barter purposes in the South Seas. Eventually, metals began to take the place of ornaments as commonly acceptable bartering material. The met were gold, silver, copper, and iron. Gold was the most valuable because it was the purest metal when mined, and being rarer, concentrated greater value in small bulk. In countries such as Britain, where gold is very rare, bars of iron were the chief means of exchange. It was now only a small step for the precious metals to be converted into handy-sized metal discs, and the symbol of money was thus created. Usually, the head of the community issued this money. For purposes of identification, it was often stamped with a picture of his head or other symbol. Indicative of the real purpose of these discs were the symbols of oxen, grain, goat, stamped on them. This type of money was not money quite as we understand it today. It served as the most convenient and generally acceptable commodity to exchange for other staple commodities. This money system persisted from early times and covered a considerable period of English history. These metal discs, however, were only worth the weight of precious metal which they contained. If you had two shillings in Queen Elizabeth's time, one being lighter than the other, the value of the lighter one was less, despite the fact that both the coins were called shillings. They were only worth their weight in metal. In important transactions, coins were weighed, and people often carried pocket weighing machines to test the value of the coins by their weight. They were careful also to see that the coins were genuine, because when making a purchase, they only got the value of the weight of true metal handed to the merchant. At this period, the only investment for money was in goods, land, or valuables. But people who had accumulated large sums of money did not always wish to invest it in these things. So they began, particularly in troubled times, to bring it for safety to the goldsmiths' shops. The goldsmiths were almost the only people who offered security in their strong rooms. Consequently, more and more people came to leave their money with them. It was eventually discovered that when people withdrew their money from the goldsmiths, they did not expect to receive back the same coins that they had previously deposited. In fact, public confidence in these old firms became such that people actually preferred to be owed the money by the goldsmiths, more especially in uncertain times. This meant that the depositors did not have to trouble themselves about their actual cash. And so it became customary for some of this money to be used in business 
on the understanding that it would be repaid when required. In this way, a primitive form of banking was started. Very soon, a new development arose. It was the custom when a man deposited money at the goldsmith's shop for him to be given a receipt for it. It was soon realized that the man who left the money, that is, the depositor, who might live many days' journey from the goldsmith, could conveniently settle a private debt by passing on this receipt. In this way, for example, the person who sold goods to a depositor became entitled to claim payment from the goldsmith. As this practice became general, the goldsmith, or banker, as he was coming to be called, began issuing receipt notes of different values to the people who had deposited money with him, instead of giving a single receipt for the whole amount. This greatly helped the settling of debts. These notes were, in effect, promises to pay. They represented the money owed by the banker. For convenience, the notes could be used, but if metal were needed, it could be demanded from the banker. As time went on, people found it a great convenience to use these notes to pay for goods which they purchased from the shop. Thus, for the first time, paper, in itself almost valuable, became valuable as a new form of money, the bank note. Instead of always giving their customers notes, the bankers in time began to give them printed forms. These forms were not unlike the notes they replaced, but they had blank spaces in which the customer could write the exact amount to pay for a purchase. It was in this way that the check system developed. The check was, in fact, a safer and more popular form of banknote. As the use of checks became more general, the banks in London would often receive from their customers checks drawn on other banks with the request to collect the money and place it to the customer's account. In early days, the bank's clerks used to walk around the city collecting the checks drawn on other banks. These clerks, in time, got to know each other in the course of their rounds, and very often they would meet one another in coffee houses. In conversation, they would find that they had checks drawn on each other's banks, which they were going to collect, and so, to save themselves trouble, they exchanged the checks and paid over or received the difference in cash. In course of time, this routine grew into an officially recognized procedure and the clearinghouse system for checks was eventually started in a room at the Five Bells of Lombard Street. In 1844, the control of bank note issues in England was taken in hand by the government through the agency of the Bank of England to ensure central supervision. The government had always of making metal coins. In both cases, the amount of money available for issue is controlled by Parliament. Parliament authorizes the amount of money that may be put in circulation. Thus, today, we have in effect three forms of currency. The banknote and metal coin issued or controlled by the government, and the checks drawn on the banks. In early times, we have seen how money was a portable and, as such, a useful means of exchanging commodities. But today, the amount of cash money collected by traders may become so bulky as to be difficult to handle. On the other hand, traders may need to draw large sums at short notice. The machinery for accepting and handling large sums in safety is provided by the banks. They also provide the organization whereby traders may draw out large sums when they require cash. Every day, the bullion vans pass between the bank's heads and their branches, carrying cash supplies where required to meet their customers' needs, or to collect cash deposited when this exceeds local requirements of branches. The money process was greatly developed by the evolution of the check system. So today, a debtor in London 
can write out a check on his bank and send it to a creditor in, say, Birmingham. This check is then usually paid in by the creditor to his account at his bank. Banks collect daily all the checks that are paid in, posting them after listing, to the central clearing house where all checks are sorted. At the clearing house, the representatives of the various banks exchange all these checks, any balance due from one bank to another being transferred through the Bank of England. The check which the debtor in London has drawn on his bank is now sent back to his branch bank by the central clearing house and debited against his bank account. In this way, the whole transaction is completed without any cash changing hands. This check is bringing the coal brought from the mines to the blast furnaces. This check is bringing a tractor coming from the factory so that a farm may increase food production. This check is providing the wages to pay workers in a large factory. This check is bringing the bricks, the timber, the plaster and the paint coming from different parts of England for the construction of new houses. We've seen how money was originally a commodity, making easier the exchange of other commodities. We have seen how it became a token and a means of keeping active the exchange of goods and services between communities. Money today, made of paper and metal, is still in token form. Although it is now recognized that the real wealth of a country lies in its natural resources and in the skill, labor, and production of its inhabitants, Money remains the most convenient means of exchanging goods and services. By providing the machinery and organization for circulating money, the banks perform an essential service, for if money did not circulate freely, the modern community could not continue on its present standards of life. Money has ceased to be merely a commodity, as it was in the early days. It now lubricates the wheels of industry and commerce, and so speeds the production and exchange of goods and services on which...